welcome to my podcast. This is Anne P. and this is the Fiber, Floss, and Fiction podcast. Today is Thursday, June the 6th, and so I'm coming to you a little bit earlier than usual, uh, but I have some things planned for the weekend, and I knew I wasn't going to get a recording done, so I thought I would sneak in today and get my podcast recorded. Uh, I hope everybody is doing well. We've finally sort of started to get spring here in the mountains. Um, it's been very cool and very rainy here, um, which is not our normal June. June is usually hot and dry and fairly windy here, but it's been great. The plants have been loving it. Um, our reservoirs are filling back up and it's certainly been nice to be able to enjoy some cool rainy weather because that's what I personally like for summer. I'm not a hot weather gal. So the cooler weather always makes me happy. Um, I do have a fair amount to talk about today, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, let me make sure I get some notes on timestamps. And so let's go ahead and get started with knitting. Um, I do have a few things finished up that were secret knitting that we'll be releasing later on this month, um, but nothing in that a little venue that I can show you right now. Um, I did, however, uh, cast on a couple of things, one of which I can show you. Um, I am looking at doing a slightly different club for Wooly Wonka Fibers next year. And I think what we're going to do is do kind of a flexible yarn club where you can either order enough of a base to do a small project, which is kind of gonna be the standard package, if you will, and then I will give some suggestions for some smaller accessory sized cowls and shawls and things like that that you could make with the yarn, but then also offer a customizable garment slash larger project size um, option for the club. And so I'm trialing out a few different things to be able to make some good suggestions and then also have some stitch alongs or knit alongs next year for club members to use up those larger projects where we're going to potentially break out the project into manageable steps and talk about anything in the pattern that might be confusing, um, give people a chance to ask questions about fit. And so I'm trying to knit ahead a little bit in order to show uh, some samples that could be used with the club yarns. So the first piece that I decided to tackle is a cardigan. You'll have to excuse the bad print quality because my printer was running out of ink, but it is the Beekeeper Cardigan by Marie Green. So this is a DK weight cardigan and I will link to the Ravelry pattern page below. The original called for a Polworth and Silk DK weight, which I actually carry. It's uh, a really nice, versatile, bouncy yarn. And I decided that I would knit my sample up in brocade, which is this honey colored yellow, gold. Not a color I wear very often, but I could see wearing it like over what I have on today. I think it would work. And I think it would look nice over a lot of those sort of periwinkle blues, which I wear a lot of as well. This is a top down, raglan construction and I have gotten it cast on and have gotten it started. It looks basically like nothing. <laughs> so here's where the sleeves are going to go. So here's the sleeve, one of the fronts, the second of the fronts, the other sleeve in the back. And you can see that it has a very simple little kind of baby bee pattern that's on a reverse stockinette ground. So I have, I believe it's about 10 more rows before I'll be at the point that the raglan shaping is done and then I can just work on the body. So it, again, doesn't look like much, but that is where this project is right now. So I'm gonna be working on this as my relaxing slash personal knitting, sort of shop knitting, um, and work on that. If you're interested in the club for next year, there'll be more information coming once we get closer into the fall. But like I said, I'm trying to kind of 
knit ahead and make some selections for things that I think might work with some of the yarns that I'm going to plan on offering in the club next year and uh, see if there's you know points that I think folks might get tripped up in various patterns and also try to find things that I think are versatile enough that lots of folks might want them for their personal wardrobes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, any spinning today because I don't really have any to show you. So we're going to move right along and talk about books. Okay, so I finished two books last week. Um, just as a note, I am still working on listening to the audiobook of Game of Thrones. I think I have like eight hours out of the 30, 31 left. So still a lot to go, but getting there. Um, and I'm also reading another book, which I'll talk about when I finish, called Luncheon of the Boating Party by Susan Breland. So look for that probably next time I talk to y'all in a couple of weeks. Okay, so the first book I finished is a book called The Keeper of Lost Things, and the author is Ruth Hogan. Um, this popped up in one of my feeds to uh, list books that are inexpensive, on sale, you know, 99 cents, free, a dollar, 99, something like that. Um, and I was looking for a book that would fit the School of Magical Stitches reading prompt about a book with a key on the cover, and this happened to have it. The price was right, I think it was 99 cents, so I went ahead and picked it up. I actually really liked this book. This was kind of a sleeper for me, you know, surprise one. It wasn't something I knew anything about, and I have not read anything by this author before. The book is told using small sort of short stories, if you will, um, that advance the larger plot line along. So there's the main plot line, and then there's these sort of little vignettes that are tucked within it. So the main character in this book is a young woman, young-ish woman, who has had a bad relationship and she gets hired by this elderly writer to basically be his housekeeper and companion. She doesn't live with him but she's at the house every day and he always keeps his office locked. He um, is older, he lost the love of his life and um, is kind of ready, ready to go if you will. Um, he sort of makes his peace with things. So it's little snippets from um, stories that he's written that are scattered throughout the book. And what we've come to find is that he has designated himself as the keeper of lost things. He finds things like uh, at a bus stop or on the ground or in a park and he labels them with what they are when he found them. And then he has in his office these storage bins and boxes and shelves that contain all of these lost things that he hopes to someday reunite with their pri prior owner. And when he passes away, he leaves the house to the housekeeper companion, but he charges her with figuring out a way to return these things to people who have missed them. And so she's a little bit broken and she is the part of the story is her moving from that place of brokenness to a more completeness and finding happiness in her life and figuring out how to do that. The cast of supporting characters in this book is really fun. Um, they're all a little bit quirky, but um, nicely developed in terms of helping the story continue um, to move the story plot forward. And so we also find out about the older author who has passed away. We find out what his backstory is and why he's decided he should be the keeper of lost things. And we learn a little bit about some of the local characters who have lost things that he has found. So we understand their stories as well in the contemporary and sort of how the object that was lost affected their life or influenced their story. Um, I thought it was really cleverly written, um, not in like a trite cutesy way, but I, I really liked the way the author was able to pull all of these disparate stories together. 
Um, I really like the fact that she was able to kind of juggle two storylines at once and give both of them equal balance and weight that they both had an important part to the book as a whole. Um, yeah, I would highly recommend it. It's an easy read. Uh, it's actually like a great summer beach read. Uh, pretty fast, um, not super long, and it's very sweet. It's a sweet story and full of kind kindness and people maybe not knowing how to do the right thing and still trying to figure out how to do the right thing. Uh, the next book I read, and I guess I should say both of these books were for prompts in School of Magical Stitching. The other book I read was The Cat Who Could Read Backwards. The prompt for that one was to find a book which had a journalist featured in it. Um, this is an older book that was written by Lillian Jackson Braun, I believe. And it's part of a longer series. There's a whole bunch of the cat who could dot 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 fin finish the phrase. Uh, so many of you may be familiar with them or have read them. This is the first book in the series. The main character is a down on his luck journalist who gets hired to write art columns at a local newspaper, even though he was originally kind of the city beat, you know, hardcore reporter who was uh, looking to get all the nitty gritty and the dirt on things and wrote them, you know, followed the murder desk and that kind of thing. So he's hired for what he feels is basically a fluff position, but winds up having a whole bunch of other things happen where he has to solve a murder uh, that involves the actual art critic at the paper. And um, it's kind of everything that you would expect from a 1960s mystery series. I don't know for sure that's exactly the time frame, but I think it's 60s into the 70s. Um, the story's fine. I mean, there was nothing earth shattering about this book and I, I did feel like it was dated. I know that things have moved along beyond where you would like go to the phone booth and make a call to your editor, right? I mean, today we would snap open our iPhone and call in or Google stuff. You wouldn't have to go research in the microfilm room, stuff like that. But just in terms of the pace of the book and the style of the writing, it felt it felt a little old to me. So if you love those sort of things, if you love that kind of classic mysteries like the Jeeves mysteries and Agatha Christie and things like that, you probably would like this series. You may have even already encountered it. Um, it wasn't one of my favorites, but it was fine. I, it fulfilled it fulfilled what I needed it to fulfill. So that's good. Um, so I have just one full book left to read for the extra credit in School of Magical Stitching. And then, like I said, I've got the Luncheon of the Boating Party to finish and Game of Thrones, Fire and Ice to finish listening to an audiobook. So I'm pretty sure I can get all those done by the end of the month. Um, and maybe a few other things just tucked in there as well for interest. Um, so that is it for reading. I am doing so well today. Maybe I should just film every week. I don't know. It requires me getting it together. Anyway, all right, let's move on to cross stitch where I have a whole bunch of other stuff to talk about. This will probably be the longest segment that we've got. All right. First things first, if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you will know that I had a pretty major finish in this past week. I completed Stargazer, um, and she is done and ready to be framed. Let's see if I can get all of her in there. This was stitched on uh, 28 count Lugana. The colorway is Phantom. It is from Picture This Plus. It is a mottled purpley blue with some red purples in it. Um, I just love it. I think it came out great on this fabric. Uh, I stitched everything based on the chart and the DMC colors called for, except for her hair. 
and I did a conversion of that. If someone's interested in it, I'll be glad to post it, but the hair is the only colors I changed. The other ones are as charted, and just against this fabric, they look completely and totally different than what is posted on the cover photo, uh, or if you do it on kind of a neutral, warm color. I was a little bit concerned about her bodice not showing up, but in the end, I think it looks just fine. I don't think that there's a problem seeing it. I think, um, you know, the, that really dark gray that you see in the jacket there, I think it looks fine. Um, I like the fact that it's not super stark against the background, that she kind of almost disappears a little bit into the night. Um, the other thing that I did not do as called for is this motif right here. I'm not sure what the deal was, but the beads that are here, these kind of, they look silver here. I got what the pattern called for and I knew when I was getting up into the sky that I was going to run out. They technically also appear in this motif right here and I had like two left and I needed 16 maybe, 20, something like that. I mean, I wasn't any, gonna be anywhere close and I was not gonna buy another whole bit, tin of them for 16 or 20, nor was I not going to get this finished last weekend. So I substituted the kind of teal blue beads that are here and I put, I put them in these arms instead and I think it looks fine. I don't dislike it. I don't have any issues with it. I don't have any problems with it. Um, what else can I say about her? I love her. Um, I guess two other notes. The first note is, honestly, when I got back into stitching again and everybody was stitching Mirabilia's and I thought, I just don't even think I'm ever gonna do one of those. I was wrong. <laughs> I don't think that the mermaids are my thing because I'm not a huge mermaid fan, but I absolutely love how this came out. And I have like 10 others now that I want to do that are in the like pretty lady group. So yeah, really love this. Um, so I will fully admit I was incorrect in my assumptions about what I like and don't like. The other thing that I wanted to say was that um, and, uh, if you follow Aviatrix Stitcher, who is Leah Noel, she talked about using um, hand dyed fabrics in a lot of her projects. And she talked about the fact, I think it was two videos ago, that she likes to spend some time, like when she started her chatelaine, figuring out where she wanted to place something on the fabric and I did kind of the same thing. I actually opted to make sure that this kind of point of uh, focus point of light was going to be in one of the lighter spots um, so that it looked like there was more light surrounding it. And I really like the fact that this shape of the die kind of mimics this shape right here you guys can see that. So I did spend some time deciding where I was going to place her on this and um, you know it's a subjective decision about where you do that. I certainly could have moved her further down. I mean there wouldn't have been anything wrong with that but um, yeah I'm just really pleased with that. So if you Decide that you're going to use a hand dyed fabric, just maybe take a minute to look at where things might fall on the fabric before you get started um, and see if the fabric can kind of help contribute to the overall look of the design. So uh, she is done. I am going to take her up to the framers uh, probably the beginning of the week and let them have her for a while to put her in something beautiful. I haven't picked a frame or anything yet, but I'll get to it. Um, that was kind of the big finish. So ta-da. Um, let's go on and let's talk about what else I am working on right now. Uh, I'm going to go through these fairly briskly and then kind of circle back and talk to you about kind of some of the things that they fit into. I'm not going to spend a ton of time discussing like specific homework necessarily, but just know that 
everything that you see is something I worked on for a magical school of magical stitches, either homework, extra credit, or ultimate challenge project. Um, let's start with the prairie schooler. This is when witches go riding, and I am working on this piece right here. Uh, I am stitching this on a 32 count, no, 28 count hand dyed linen that I dyed myself um, using hand dyed silks that I also dyed myself and I got a ton of progress on this. Um, I finished all of the wording. I came down here and I worked on the ground and the pumpkins. I finished the house. I started on the picket fence or whatever type fence and the witch. I'm actually thinking I might be able to get this finished this month. I have it slated for a couple of prompts and it's really a pretty fast stitch. So yeah, we'll see. It would be really nice to maybe have this one done as well. June is a month for finishes. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I'm not going to like put the pressure on myself that I have to finish it, but I'm going to be working on it. And if I get anywhere close that I feel like, yeah, if I just, you know, kind of push through, I can do it. I will probably go ahead and get it finished. So there is that one. Uh, I also pulled out my sam summer sampler from Cooler Design Studios. Uh, you can get this as a downloadable chart on their website, or I think 123 Stitch is carrying the print versions now. You might remember this was a restart from earlier in the year. I am stitching this on a 32 count Murano from x Designs in the colorway Sand. And this is where I am. This looks like basically nothing. Um, <laughs> this is the center vignette right here of the two little kids playing on at the ocean at the edge of the ocean with the sand castle and everything. So I worked on the ocean and the sand. You can kind of see there's this ghostly little figure here that's gonna be the little boy, and then the sand castle in the middle and the little girl over here, but I have not started stitching on them particularly. 10 times, 100 times happier with this on this fabric than I was on the 40 count I was trying to use. I just, it's so much better, so much better. Um, so there is where I am on that. Next up, I have been working on Joan Elliott's Winter Fairy. And I am working this on, I think it is, yeah, it's a 32 count Joblin from Color and Cotton. This was their July 2017 um, Fabric of the Month Club. So I got a lot done on her. I put um, 1,200 stitches into her, so a decent amount. Um, I finished this wing and this wing, and then I added this wing and these parts of the wings as well as these. I finished all of the back stitching that needs to be done up here in her hair and finished the leaves in the crown and then I started on her bodice. Um, there's some space left you can see there for beads around her neck. There's like pearls and some up in her hair. Um, but I'm trying to back stitch and do the crinic as I go on the way down so that I don't have quite so much to do. There are more beads that appear up in the sky. Which you can see here but I'm gonna do those at the end. So um, yeah, I'm, I really had enjoyed working on her and I love how she's looking. I really like the Joan Elliott fairies. I think their faces are, are beautiful. So there she is. Next, this I didn't put a ton of stitches in, but I did do a little bit of work on it. Um, this is Jim Shore's artwork, 12 Days. It was a kit from Design Works, but I am replacing the fabric, although I'm using the kit floss, which theoretically is DMC, but I'm not sure that it really is in real life. 
Um, so there is what he will look like when he's done. I am stitching this one over one on a 22 count heart hanger. Um, the colorway is Legacy by Picture This Plus. And all I did was I added um, some blue to this quilt block right here and then I extended the border down in that kind of blurple color. So not a ton, but I'm just, you know, using these for um, homework prompts when I can and just as I get them, get stitches in them, they get stitches in them. I'm not too worried about a finish or, you know, I don't have any specific time frame on that one, just working on it. Now, I don't think I showed you the last little bit of work that I had done on the Village of Hawk Run Hollow piece that I'm working on. I know y'all know what this looks like, but here it is again, just in case. Um, this is done on the same 22 count heart hanger in Legacy from Picture This Plus. And I worked on the grist mill, which is the center block. Here's the whole shebang. So I put more stitches in. Um, I worked this like little hill and I worked the tree up. I added stitches here in the building and I think I also did a few of the stitches over here in that kind of bluey green color. So, yep. Again, nothing specific for when I want to finish this or a time frame or anything like that. Just working on it when it fits a homework prompt. Um, since I had hit my goal of finishing these two blocks this year. Um, but I'm, you know, in good shape to finish this one. I cannot find, I know I have it, I cannot find the yellow ochre that goes there. I think Magpie Cat has taken that bobbin and has done something with it. But anyway, I'm going to have to order more because I don't have it in my um, bag of extra floss. And I, you know, when I when I order something else, I will order it. I'm not going to order one skein of DMC. That just seems overkill. Just have to remember to actually order it. And then the last piece I'm going to show you is another Joan Elliott piece. It is called Celtic Wheel. If I can find it. Here it is. It is in the book Bewitching Cross Stitch. And this is what it will look like when it's finished. It's a square piece. It has the eight Celtic festivals of the year on it. And I am working this on, it's a 32 count Lugana from Color and Cotton. It is their, her, her, the words, Angela's colorway is Sampler Gold. And here it is. I worked on this big Celtic braid motif in the corner. Put in 500 stitches on that. Okay, so that is everything I have worked on in the 10 days or so since the last time I talked to you. So um, let's talk a little bit about kind of what's going on and some plans and things that you can expect to see and all of that good stuff. I've got a huge mess going on here. Okay, so obviously still continuing on with School of Magical Stitches and Literature. Um, weekly homework, I just will do that once it occurs. I finished this week's homework. That was the stitches I put in on Winter Fairy. The thousand stitches that I did first on that went towards that. Um, I have just finished all of the May, June extra credits, so those are done. And the things that I'm going to concentrate on now, I have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I have five ultimate tasks, which are the thousand stitch a piece challenges left to do. And I think that I have two of those that I'm going to try to work on for the rest of this month and get off my plate. So those will be, that will be ongoing upcoming. Um, I'm picking and choosing some stuff in Kate's Lord of the Rings group. Uh, the Stitchy Quest group. Um, I'm not doing all of those challenges because my head is just like full to bursting in terms of trying to remember what thing goes with what challenge and 
I just want to focus on some things right now to like see some actual progress and not do just little bits and bobs um, on every single thing I'm working on. So when I can fit things in, I will. Um, otherwise, I'm just kind of going with her. Um, she has a stitching to mortar challenge. And so all you're doing for that is counting stitches. It's, you just, there are certain stages on it. So the one I'm working on right now is um, Rivendell to Lonely Mountain in it's 11,780 stitches. So I'm just working on whatever I work on goes towards those. Okay, and then the big thing that's happening. Um, I am also a member of the 24-hour cross-stitch marathon group, which is on Facebook. I will endeavor to link it below. Um, Jen and her mom did 24 hours of stitching last year, I think it was, and have decided to kind of make this into a more formal challenge. And they have two things going on right now, the first of which is the June challenge for their group, which is to slot in projects for the letters that spell out 24. And I've slotted some things in already. And the way that they're doing this is you can either count stitches or you can count minutes. And there's three different tiers of each. And I, since I'm already counting stitches, I'm just doing stitches. That seems easiest for me. And the prompts are very loose. So for instance, um, I mean, some of them are straightforward. Like the W in 20, I used when witches go riding because it begins with a W. Some of the other ones, I'm being a little bit more flexible. Like for Y, I used the Celtic year because it's, the, or the Celtic wheel because it's the year of the festivals. It's a whole year's worth, so that's my why. So it doesn't have to necessarily be the name of the project or the name of the designer. If you can figure out some way to tie it in, um, like for instance, for O and four, I'm gonna use over dyed floss um, in that particular project, which happens to be snow for Christmas. Now, I'm shooting for 1200 stitches per project, but that's a lot to do. And so if I don't get there, it's, it's okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. I wanna work on each of these 10 projects that are listed though um, during the year or during the month and at least puts the minimum 120 stitches in on each of them. So going forward, whatever I can slot in for those, I will. Now I've completed the first three, which are the stargazer, and I didn't get 1200 stitches on that, but hey, I finished it, so that's totally good. Um, w, when witches go riding, I put in my 1200 stitches. Winter fairy, I put in 1200 stitches. Um, next up, I'm gonna use um, a stitching shelf, which is my big full coverage project for several of these prompts and see if I can knock out more than 1200 stitches on that um, but I will update you with that after you know I've worked on it for the next couple of weeks. The second part of the 24 hours of cross stitch is the 24 hours of cross stitch marathon that is happening this weekend. Now Jen has said that it is perfectly fine to do whatever level of participation you want, whether it's you know 24 minutes, 24 hours, more or less, whatever. Participate, that's the fun. I am going to try to do the 24 hours because it's now spread out over the weekend. It starts at four on Friday and it goes to four until 4 p.m. on Sunday. Um, I am firmly in the team sleep category. I cannot go without sleep anymore. It really is not good for me. And I know there's lots of folks who are also in that particular bucket of things. So um, I'm going to still sleep and eat and take a shower and I am gonna probably like get the dog out for a walk and all of that kind of stuff because I don't think it's good just to sit for 48 hours. Um, but I have, like pre-planned food so I don't really need to cook. I'm here by myself this weekend. Um, so I'm just gonna give it a go. And one thing that Jen had suggested that we think about doing is set some kind of monetary goal for the number of stitches, number of units, whether it's minutes or hours or whatever that we stitch and think about making a cash donation 
or a donation to a charitable organization for that. Uh, I think I have decided on which one, which of our local organizations I would like to do, but I want to double check that they are in a space that they could, I know this seems stupid, but our little town has an animal shelter and they're at like 145% of their annual donation budget already. And while of course I'm happy to donate to a good cause, if they already kind of have what they need and some other charity that I feel strongly about doesn't, I would rather send the money to the charity that needs to have the funds kind of made up to get to their point. So I will tell you for sure which one I have picked when I come back next time, but my goal is to do $10 donation for every hour that I stitch. And I'm gonna shoot for 240 um, or 24, $240. And let's see how I do with that. Um, I'm gonna do some updates on my Instagram feed over the weekend. I'll probably do a vlog post so that I can include that in my next podcast so you guys can see what I work on. Um, I'm definitely gonna be working on a stitching shelf. I know that, that's already on my frame. It's queued up, it's ready to start You know when Friday comes. In the meantime, I'm thinking I'm gonna pull a couple of other things to include the wheel of the year because i put 500 odd stitches in that i'd like to try to get that to the 1200 mark since it's on my list here and i'm also thinking the same thing for summer sampler that i'm going to try to get the other 700 stitches put in that because i got about 500 put in for homework I try to get that to that 1200 stitch level those are possibilities. Um, my other options are that I may focus on either Snow for Christmas, which you guys haven't seen in a little while, but could use some stitches and is on my, my list, or when witches go riding and try to see if maybe I can bang out a finish on that. I know that I cannot stitch and work on one project for 24 hours in three days. I'll just get so burned out on it and I don't want to get burned out on anything. I want to be able to have some time where I'm not sitting hunched over my frame, that maybe I'm sitting outside, hanging out with the dog, you know, enjoying the beautiful weather that we're having, um, getting up and walking around occasionally, all of that good stuff. So that is my plan for this weekend. Um, I'm going to do a little stitching marathon. Let's see how things go. And then I will check back in with you guys next time. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram about my stitching, I am Little Bird Stitcher, all one word. And um, as always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook as well as Holy Wonka Fibers if you're interested in the end of the yarn end of my world. One more quick announcement that I wanted to make before I finish up here, still hoping up for under an hour, um, is that in the Full Coverage Fanatics group coming up for July, uh, we have a brand new challenge that is going on and it is linked to the Tour de France. Um, there is an event post there, which I will also link to below. And what we're gonna do is basically stitch the tour um, we're going to stitch the number of kilometers that the uh, riders will be riding for the tour. You can commit to uh, going for the yellow jersey where you stitch all of those stitches, um, which is 3,700 plus. Um, and then we have two other stages that you can choose from if you think maybe you're going to be on vacation or don't have as much time to, to commit to. Um, one of which will be the um, spotted jersey which is for the mountain stages. So you'll just be stitching the number of kilometers that are ridden on mountain stage days. And then the other is the green sprinters jersey, which is days that the riders will ride um, the flats. So you can pick and choose from either yellow, green, or spotted jersey. And if you have not participated in any of our challenges in the Full Coverage Fanatics group, um, you can also go for the white jersey, which indicates rookie status. So the tour will be starting on the 6th of July. And like I said, there is information in the Full Coverage Fanatics event for the tour that will show you which days are which stages and what the number is of stitches you have to stitch. Some days are more, some days are less. Um, you can stitch ahead 
after the 6th, meaning no stitches in your project before July 6th. After that, if you have a day where you're cranking along and maybe you only have 127 stitches to put in, but you can put in 200, you can go ahead and work ahead um, for that. The tour will end at the end of July. Um, I think it's the 28th. And so all of your stitches have to be done by that point. And there's a couple of rest days in there so you can make up your stitches if you miss a day um, on a stage, for instance, and you need to catch up. Um, so there's some ways that you can work around things like life and you know va maybe vacation planning or things that you've got on your schedule. A really fun way to get at least a thousand stitches into your full coverage project for the month and um, just a fun way to celebrate the tour. Um, I know we've got a few folks in the group who are diehard Tour de France fans so um, hopefully they will um, be there to you know cheer all of us on um, so I hope you'll join us if you have a full coverage project that you're interested in working on and maybe needed a little motivation to kick it into gear um, and you can come and see what everybody else is working on as well so I think that's gonna do me for today I'm even under 45 minutes go me um, I hope everybody's doing great I hope whatever your plans for this weekend are you have um, some great weather to enjoy them whether indoor or outdoor and um, I will check in with you all again in about two weeks um, so until then take care everybody have a wonderful weekend be kind <laughs>